for coming tonight. I know many of you have come from quite far away. We have, let's figure out who's the farthest. We have people from Texas, right? Yes. Anybody farther than Texas? Australia. Oh my God. <laughs> So thank you for coming. My name is Maria Spart, I'm the National Director of DSA. And actually, I was, I got involved in DSA through the youth section. I was uh, in, I was at the University of Chicago and the YDS chapter there had an event called What is Socialist Feminism? And I was very active in the feminist group on campus. I was intrigued, I went to the event and got involved in the chapter and then I got involved with the national. I became one of the national co-chairs and um, was involved there, and then I got involved in DSA, and then I was elected to the DSA National Political Committee, and now I'm the national director, so you all should try to have a future and a career in DSA. Um, <laughs> but I just took over recently, and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Um, we're gonna start tonight by talking about Occupy Wall Street, and also about the student movement and the history of the student movement. And um, the panel is called From Protest to Disruption, Organizing for Social Change. And the, the context to think about this in is that Democratic Socialists, DSA, and YDSers have been involved in the struggle against austerity, against neoliberal capitalism for a long time. Just this summer, we were working with coalition partners around the country to organize, you know, to disrupt town halls in congressional districts, to organize rallies. Um, and then uh, it was having no effect. The right was completely dominating the debate. And then Occupy Wall Street happened, and it completely changed everything. And YDSers were actually involved here in New York before, when it was Bloombergville, before it even became Occupy Wall Street. Uh, but uh, the phenomenon that is Occupy Wall Street has completely changed uh, the political landscape. And the question that we need to think about is, how, sh how can we sustain the momentum of Occupy? Can and should Occupy shift policy outcomes as much as it, has, as it has shifted the debate, because it has certainly put inequality and poverty back on the agenda, but you don't see different policy outcomes <coughs> yet. Uh, and what are the lessons of history? What can student activists today learn from our predece predecessors? So we have three wonderful panelists tonight. The first one is Frances Fox Piven. She's a DSA honorary chair. She's a distinguished sociologist at the Graduate Center of CUNY, the City University of New York and she's the author of The War at Home, Domestic Costs of Bush's Militarism, Poor People's Movements, Why Americans Don't Vote, The New Class War, and her most recent book, Who's Afraid of Francis Fox Piven? <laughs> the essential writings of the professor Glenn Beck loves to hate. Um, so let's welcome Fran. We'll have two other panelists, Jim Miller, who is the Chair of Liberal Studies and Professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research. His latest book, Examine Lies from Socrates to Nietzsche, and from 2000 to 2008, he edited Daedalus, a journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow, an NEH Fellow twice, and in 2006 and 2007, he was a fellow at the Dorothy and, and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. Let's welcome him. <laughs> and then our final panelist will be Steve Max, who's a DSA vice chair. He's, he's what actually was one of the first organizers of SDS, the original SDS. He's a longtime activist in civil rights, labor, and community movements, and he helped found the Midwest Academy, and now he's a trainer and the designer of their economic, their popular education grassroots economics training program. So I'll give you so we're going to hear from our three panelists in this order, and then we'll have time for a little Q&A before we end for the evening, and then I, I'm sure a bunch of people are going to go out. <laughs> so first, let's start with Francis Buxton. I was going to stand on the table, but there's a mic here, I think, so I'd better stay here. Uh, I'm always glad to come and speak at YDS. I do it a lot, and because I do it so much, I'm not exactly sure what I've already said and what I should say now. So let me begin by saying what I think are our points of agreement. 
I think we all agree that protest movements have been the main agency for humanitarian reform in American history. That without protest movements, without the radical Democrats of the revolutionary era, without the abolitionists, without the populist farmers, without the labor movement, without the unemployed, without the civil rights movement, this country would be even worse, much worse than it is today. And it's for that reason that I think all of us also agree with a kind of excitement that could be a once in a lifetime experience that Occupy is the social movement of our time and it may help us to recover much of this country that has been lost. So what is it that Occupy has done, can do? What is it that social movements do that changes politics in the United States and in other countries as well? I think there are two kinds of transforming effects that social movements have. First, they are brilliant agents of communication. They change the discourse. They force new issues that politicians and their interest group allies, those issues that they want to keep suppressed, that they want to bury in a cloud of propaganda, they project those issues in ways that cannot be denied. That's important. And protest movements do that. You know how they do that. They do that with songs and banners and demonstrations and chants. We love that stuff. I love it. <laughs> the other thing that protest movements do that has an impact on the institutions of the society and on the political system of the country is that they threaten disorderly disruption. They threaten the regular operation of the institutions of the society and that disruption reverberates on national politics. Well, we agree about that, I think. And so we can use that framework to assess where Occupy is now. Occupy began, it was a surprise in the fall. There was Bloombergsville and all <coughs> sorts of prefatory testing demonstrations. But Occupy began in this little park. I didn't know it was there. Uh, it was four blocks north of Wall Street. But they declared that it was Wall Street and that they were occupying Wall Street. And there were a few hundred people and more people came. And then they yelled out the slogan, we are the 99%. They were entertaining, nice. They didn't turn anybody away. I think there were even some tea partiers down there for a while. Uh, they reached out to labor, invited them down, and at first the mainstream media did what it has been doing to the left for 40 years. They either ignored Occupy or they laughed at them. They said, where are your demands, by which they meant, I think, legislative proposals because Occupy's demand, its big demand, was perfectly clear. We are the 99%. We're occupying Wall Street because Wall Street is where the 1% is. That was pretty clear, I thought. Anyway, their theatrics were so clever and appealing, and the fact that more and more people were coming, it resonated 
Soon the mainstream media was not ignoring them. The New York Times featured the food group at Occupy in their food section. Uh, and incredibly, the occupations spread. There were occupations everywhere. Occupy McPherson Square, Occupy Philadelphia, Occupy Oakland, Occupy Denver. All over the country, there were occupations. It was good. There was something, it was a thing everybody could do. You could find a park or the space in front of City Hall. Uh, and Occupy had slogans that were really catchy and good. And it spread even across the globe, there were occupations. And pretty soon, it was clear that the issue of extreme inequality had been projected into American politics, and it couldn't be ignored. And even Obama, I shouldn't say even Obama, after all, he did say, we are the change we've been waiting for. There was that Obama. Uh, and you could see it even in the way Obama, in Obama's rhetoric, that he could not ignore extreme inequality. So, in fact, they were so effective that they decided to clear the occupations. If they had been occupying Wall Street, you could understand why they would clear it. They were occupying this park, that park, the other park. They cleared those encampments <coughs> because they did want to stop the rhetoric, because it was having an impact, which was, I think, a mistake. Because Occupy understood that it might get cleared away, that the police would come one day. In fact, there had been many abortive attempts to clear the occupations. And Occupy, the many Occupies, because there isn't one Occupy, had been trying to figure out what they were going to do next. And that's where we are now. I think one way to try to understand where we are now is that it has to do with moving to the second phase, to the other thing, to the other achievement of every important movement in American history. And that is the ability to mobilize, to organize people to refuse cooperation in the institutions which require their cooperation. That's what Occupy is beginning to do. It's doing it with its home occupations. They're small still, but they could get very big because the mortgage industry and the banks that need that fake capital on their books are everywhere. They have Millions of homes are underwater. Home occupations. Then there are the student protests that are planned for the spring. What if we occupied, we don't have to occupy the whole university. What if we had an occupation at every university? The occupations have a kind of organizing function that's important because it's, everybody knows where the protest is. It's like a picket line. You know to go to the picket line if you want to help the strikers. Well, we have to have an occupation at every university. Maybe it's the lobby of the administration building, but maybe it's the Spanish study center. Not so important. It's important to have a place. And from those places, we ought to try to organize a massive, widespread uh, refusal of students to pay those student debts, and maybe even a refusal of students to pay the hiked up tuition that they've been stuck with as a result of the austerity politics of business. And then there are the labor actions that Occupy has already begun to participate in. The International Longshoremen's Union has boldly said, 
We love Occupy. They are one with us. So we're at a new phase in the movement. It's going to be tougher and rougher. We're not going to all be able to make every decision through a general assembly that requires 90% consensus. We're going to be working with poor people. We're going to be working with workers. We're going to be working with students. And also, we're going to have to learn to cope with the efforts to repress the movement. Those efforts are going to be military efforts because we live in at a time in American society when the militarization of the police is pretty complete. We're going to have to figure out how to withstand those efforts. The stakes are very, very large. We are a part of something that is much bigger than us. The, as the 2012 election unfolds, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say, well, the election is very important. You should leave the movement and work for Obama or work for the Democratic delegation in your state. They're right and they're wrong. The election is very important. But I think if history is any guide, we can have a bigger, stronger effect on the election by escalating the movement than by going out and ringing doorbells to try to persuade people to turn out to vote. It's a key point in the evolution of this movement. Movements are not one great sweep. They don't explode like fireworks on 4th of July. They are here and they're there. They go through different phases. They stutter, but they go on. And I think this movement has to go on, I would say, for a decade for us to make substantial gains. Thank you. I'm going to go in a little bit different direction here, uh, I think, uh, perhaps because I'm a little less sanguine uh, at the moment in the long-term possibilities of what Occupy can accomplish. And I think that people like you in this room are going to be key to uh, uh, seeing what kind of sustainability this movement has, uh, because I think a lot depends on the variety and diversity of the people that support it. Uh, uh, to put it very briefly, I think that Occupy is at a crossroads. On the one hand, uh, it, it, was an, it created the rudiments of an accidental mass movement. It's, I don't think what, what they originally thought would happen. And the crossroads are the people who created it, do they go forward with a, uh, uh, a strategy that's based on exemplary acts of resistance? Uh, from uh, which could mean anything from occupying abandoned buildings to breaking windows and battling with cops, or do they go in the direction of trying to build a mass movement by uh, trying to organize debt strikes, alliances with labor, and even with Democrats? And uh, those uh, choices are um, in some tension with each other as a choice point. And what's crucial, I think, to understand about the situation and what I'm going to talk about is that for the first time in a hundred years, revolutionary anarchists have created this movement. They own it in this city. And I think for you as a democratic socialist, you need to understand that. Um, on the afternoon of August 2nd, 2011, a group of self-selected activists, about 60 in all, met at Bowling Green, a park in downtown Manhattan. They gathered in response to a call by the magazine Adbusters for a general assembly to organize an occupation of Wall Street to begin on September 17th. Some were socialists, but a surprising number were conservatives and libertarians committed to leaderless resistance. I've actually done some historical research on this, and there were a lot of libertarians there at the outset. 
Still more were avowed anarchists, including, most importantly, David Graeber, a 50-year-old professor of anthropology and a veteran activist and the person who coined the phrase, we are the 99%. Expecting an open assembly, Graeber and his friends discovered instead a group of what they regarded as conventional organizers with megaphones and placards trying to rally participants for a conventional march that would make conventional demands. In response, Graeber and his group retreated to a corner of the park to discuss alternative next steps. Graeber proposed implementing one of the most radical forms of direct democracy conceivable, a movement that would be built around a daily general assembly where virtually all decisions would be made without voting by consensus. It seemed quixotic, but Graeber's vision prevailed and against all odds, the movement that he has helped to launch, Occupy Wall Street, as we've already said, has been a stunning success. It's transformed the political conversation in America. It's compelled the media to pay fresh attention to voices on the left. Despite a lack of explicit demands, the movement has, in the words of one um, uh, follower, quote, reignited hope in the possibility of a free society in part by exemplifying, in the words of this participant, a new world that is, quote, participatory and democratic to the core. In this way, Occupy Wall Street has resurrected a defining aspect of the new left of the 1960s, an overriding commitment to participatory democracy understood as the making of decisions in a face-to-face -face community of friends and not through elected representatives. The ongoing experiment of Occupy movements around the world with the General Assembly process is a welcome reminder, and I agree here with Fran, that politics isn't just about elections and voting. It's also proof, if proof were needed, that the Port Huron Statement, the 1962 Manifesto of Students for a Democratic Society, which first popularized the ideal of participatory democracy, has left a living legacy, however paradoxical. As I wrote a quarter century ago in my book, Democracy is in the Streets from Port Huron to the Siege of Chicago, perhaps the most important result of the 60s experiment with participatory democracy, at least in my view, was to demonstrate, quote, the incompatibility of rule by consensus with accountable, responsible government in a large organization or even in a small group of people with divergent interests and a limited patience for endless meetings. Even this modest lesson has proved hard to learn, however, perhaps because as I also wrote, quote, for anyone who joined in the search for a democracy of individual participation and certainly for anyone who remembers the happiness and holds to the hopes that the quest itself aroused the sense of what politics can mean will never be quite the same again. The result, I think, for many subsequent groups on the global left has been an unstable political idealism, an amalgam of direct action and direct democracy, with many of the virtues of a utopian and romantic revolt, passion, moral conviction, a shared joy in the joining of battle, but also some of the vices. Above all, an obsession with the purity of democratic process and a zeal for enabling autonomous, militant groups to act as they please, no matter how violently, and no matter the negative political implications for more moderate potential political allies. Take the case of Occupy Wall Street. Though the general assemblies that have become a hallmark of the Occupy movement have not been uniformly organized in every single city, many of them have followed the example of New York City. Avowedly anti-authoritarian, non-hierarchical, and leaderless, the New York assemblies have generally adhered to rule by consensus as an end in itself and as the best way to prove that direct democracy can work in practice. At first, the New York City General Assembly seemed to succeed in some of its most utopian objectives. And for many of us who thought we would never see such a moment again, it was um, very exciting at the outset. But the General Assemblies, at least in New York City, have begun to diminish in importance 
Effective decision-making on many matters, both logistical and political, has devolved to a number of so-called working groups that meet separately and have fallen under the control of various individuals who have assumed power within the movement. In an effort to acknowledge the new situation, the General Assembly in Zuccotti Park voted to institute an operational so-called spokes council, bringing together spokespeople from these working groups, which began to meet regularly in November of last year on nights when the General Assembly wasn't in session. In this way, among others, the occupation in New York City slowly has turned from, quote, experiences of visionary inspiration, in the words of David Graeber, to, quote, a much slower, painstaking struggle of creating alternative institutions. But that is not all. For besides proceeding in a slower and more painstaking manner, the groups working on direct action, especially any that are planning a more or less militant or violent direct action, naturally have put a premium on solidarity and discretion, not on an open airing of doubts and disagreements. It is tempting for the most important members of such groups to meet privately in an effort to avoid the inconvenience of endless meetings open to anyone, including informers and police. And if this in fact happens, a movement begins to elaborate a hidden structure. Cadre in the know uh, are able to shuttle between secret meetings and public assemblies that attract larger numbers of potential sympathizers. This duplicitous structure, familiar from communist fronts, and some radical anarchist organizations like Bakunin's so-called Secret and Universal Association of the International Brothers, and also used by some new left groups in the late 60s, enables underground organizers to mold the views and direct the actions of those gathered in more public assemblies. In effect, a public show of democracy risks becoming a facade, a front for a small vanguard of de facto leaders. Um, I'm going to skip over um, a passage in this paper where I talk about some of the problems with participatory democracy as an ultimate goal, because it's important for the anarchists in Occupy Wall Street, this is not just a process that's a means, it is a way of living now the life, the kind of institutional life that prefigures a new free society. Um, I want to bore down for a moment and come back to the issue of um, direct action and militant tactics. As David Graeber has observed and as veterans of the battle in Seattle and other transcendental moments of embattled moral clarity can attest, street fighting with police can be heady, even transporting. Quote, I'm, this is David Graeber again. It is a way to create one fleeting moment when autonomy is real and immediate, a space of liberated territory in which the laws and arbitrary power of the state no longer apply, in which we draw the lines of force ourselves. After my own participation in the whole world is watching showdown between police and protesters in Chicago in August 1968, and similarly electrified by the confrontation, I, like other militants, heap scorn on the dreary compromises involved in electoral politics. And this brings me to perhaps the most insidious paradox of participatory democracy, when a movement that pursues its aims through polarizing protests simultaneously demands consensus in its public organs of self-government. The paradox unfolds as follows. The success of a polarizing movement hinges on obtaining publicity and sympathetic attention from outsiders. The surest way to obtain such publicity is through demonstrations that prompt a disproportionate and unjust response from the authorities. Meanwhile, back in the public assemblies, the demand for consensus willy-nilly puts the most uncompromising militants, including many of those who in fact have spurred the growth of the movement and become militant activists by taste as well as by political conviction, in a position in which they can veto the tactics and strategy proposed by more cautious comrades. The group itself becomes polarized. The militants go underground. But consensus remains the holy grail of the public meetings, and the moderates in the group are by definition inclined to compromise. Indeed, in this context, ideological disputes 
are informally discouraged. Since any open debate, for example, over the value of so-called black bloc street fighting tactics or the meaning of the group's ostensible commitment to nonviolent civil disobedience might undermine the group's solidarity and might violate the autonomy of the most militant individuals in the larger association. So the moderates silence their reservations and in some cases simply choose to drop out. Officially, a diversity of tactics may even be endorsed, but the consensus view that prevails in public is generally the most radical alternative on offer, an extreme illustration of what Cass Sunstein has called the law of group polarization. That is why I, for one, worry that the violence and vandalism in Occupy Oakland on January 28th is an omen of bad things to come and why I was struck when I was on the West Coast that the longshoreman union official I spoke with was deeply worried that it was entirely possible if occupiers decided unilaterally to call a general strike on May 1st without any outreach to his rank and file union members, there could be fistfights between occupiers and union members. Still, these are early days. Around the world, the injustices that have given rise to the Occupy movement remain largely unaddressed. Since the many different general assemblies affiliated with the movement are works in progress, it's impossible to predict how this latest experiment in participatory democracy will unfold. Much of it depends on who stays involved in the process. And who knows? If today's radical Democrats can avoid fetishizing the demand for consensus, and instead deploy rule by consensus only in situations where it is useful, a new generation of activists may yet prove able to forge a genuinely mass movement for a more participatory democracy that is broader and open to a greater diversity of opinion, one that is able to welcome advocates of moderation, pragmatism, and tolerance, and not just the voluptuaries of unrestrained direct action. In any case, that's the sort of socialist movement that I'd like to see in 2012, a half century after Port Huron. Well, a number of people have talked about the, uh, the way Occupy has changed the debate and has opened up uh, hope about the direction we're going in. So I don't need to say that again except to highlight one additional thing uh, that Occupy has done, uh, and that is it's put the word capitalism back in the discussion, uh, and we hear it now being said once again in, in uh, liberal political circles and unions uh, in academia, uh, where people were afraid to use the word uh, for a number of years, uh, because once you start to name the system, you imply that it needs a name so that it won't get confused with a different system, which nobody thought existed anymore, uh, but it does, uh, and that's the alternative, uh, which is socialism. Now, Occupy poses some, uh, some challenges and, and, and opportunities uh, for, for YDS and for DSA as well. I mean, one, one question is, do we even continue? Why not just all join uh, OWS? After all, it's what I always wanted as a kid. Right? It's a sleepover with drums. <laughs> but the, the, the question now is how does a socialist perspective differ from the discourse that you might hear around OWS? And I fully understand that like YDS, OWS isn't a, uh, uh, a united uh, point of view, it's, it's not an entity with one idea. Uh, both groups uh, are more or less like being Jewish, which can, which can be anything you want it to be uh, if you are Jewish. Uh, and those of you who are of a persuasion that don't understand this, just ask a number of Jewish people who will give you a different answer each, and that's the point. But there are nonetheless some main ideas and trends in democratic socialism that are different from some of the uh, anarchist-inspired uh, theories around OWS. And I'm not talking about OWS as a whole now, but, but I'm talking about the, the one more or less sort of coherent uh, theoretical approach to social change that you are apt to hear there uh, among many that, uh, that exist. 
Now, the, the anarchist view and the socialist view uh, both start out being anti-capitalist, which makes them similar and, and sound similar. Uh, but the difference lies in the strategy to end capitalism and in the vision of what replaces it. Uh, democratic socialists tend to think that the government has a key role to play. And we fight for control of government in order to win changes that help people and weaken capitalism at the same time. Uh, limiting repayment of student loans, as Fran suggested, is a good example. Uh, so is single payer national health care, uh, which not only gives better health care, but puts the entire private health insurance industry out of business. Now, the anarchist view tends to be that government is uniformly evil and irrelevant, except as a tool of oppression. Uh, and that the way to end capitalism is simply to walk away from it. Now, some think violence advances the process, others don't. Mainly, the idea is to set up parallel structures, organs of dual power, assemblies for example, let every neighborhood have its own assembly and start making its own decisions without government. Let workers take over closed factories and turn them uh, in, in, into productive places again. Let neighbors uh, open stores and, and start selling stuff as co-ops and these are all fine ideas and they all have merit on their own and they all should be done but they aren't a strategy for ending capitalism. In fact, when applied to the question of ending capitalism, these approaches fall into the broad category of rutabaga theories. <laughs> now you know what a rut rutabaga is, right? It's a kind of weird turnip. <laughs> And, and back in the anti-Vietnam War movement in the 60s, I first heard the idea that if everybody would eat rutabaga, we would have world peace. <laughs> and that is totally true. It can be demonstrated. We don't have time to do it tonight, but it can be. What all rutabaga theories of social change have in common is that they start out with the words, if everyone would. Right? And then the outcome that follows is usually true. Right? Because if you could get everyone to eat a rutabaga, you could get them to do anything. <laughs> if everyone would go to a neighborhood assembly, we wouldn't need government. Well, except to take away the garbage. But the problem with theories that begin with if everyone would, is that everyone won't. We socialists know that people move in large numbers, really big numbers, enough to make a difference, when they have a common problem and can see a common solution. When thousands of people couldn't figure out how to raise their income, they came together as the Tea Party to lower their taxes, which amounts to the same thing in dollars. And of course, it helped to have some billionaires funding the whole thing. There are three examples of rutabaga thought in American history uh, that more or less say that we can challenge capitalism uh, through parallel institutions if everyone would. If everyone would join communistic communities. Right, back in the 1870s, there were roughly 5,000 people living in about 70 communistic communities. Now 5,000 people doesn't sound like a lot, but remember that back then the population of the whole country was only 38 million compared to 230 million now. So as a percentage, there were probably more people living in communistic communities then than recently occupied public parks now. And, and they pooled their money and they bought land and they built model villages and they lived together. Uh, and some communities were religious and some were secular. Some practiced free love, others were celibate, everything in between. They held their property in common. They shared the proceeds equally. Some did farming, some did manufacturing. They tried to set up self-government with, with anti-capitalist communities within capitalism. And the idea was that when everyone saw what a great idea these self-governing communities were, then everyone would want to have one too, and capitalism would be over. But it isn't over. <laughs> With the exception of the Shakers, those communities either fell apart or privatized. The idea that everybody would move to a utopian village and we could end capitalism is a rutabaga theory. People didn't opt out and end capitalism just because somebody had a great idea. Now another wave of those communities was started in the 60s and grew out of the, the New Left and the student movement 
And unlike the earlier societies, they attempted to operate without structure and without leadership. As a friend of mine who lived in one told me, our idea was that our hands would just find the work that needed to be done. But somehow, some hands consistently found less work than others, and there was nothing anybody could do about it because there was no structure. When what brought people together was their dislike for government outside the house, there was always somebody who didn't like it inside the house either. However revolutionary they thought themselves, they were not a strategy for ending capitalism. It was a rutabaga theory. Those of you who just walked in probably think I'm mad because you don't know what a rutabaga is. Just, just ask anybody. <laughs> now, when we're around OWS, we often hear from, from some of the more thoughtful people, and, I, and they are, uh, about cooperatives as a method for walking away from capitalism. I'm talking about businesses that are worker-owned or consumer-owned, uh, except for uh, housing cooperatives. These aren't communities where people go to live uh, and make their own rules. They're, they're basically business arrangements. Uh, the first known cooperative was way back in 1769. And the early co-ops were burial societies, and they expanded them to be health insurance. They became credit unions, and they now include every type of factory, agricultural, and service enterprise that's out there. Now, co-ops are wonderful non-capitalist ideas, although they are intertwined with capitalism. In England, the largest single independent travel agency is a co-op. And when you look at the numbers of them, the numbers rise when the capitalist economy is doing well, and they shrink uh, in times of recession, just like all other businesses. Co-ops are wonderful. They make people's lives better. They don't exploit workers or consumers. The United Nations estimates that there are about, <laughs> there were about, <laughs> 800 million people worldwide who belong to co-ops, and the UN says that 3 billion, half the world's population, have their lives improved because of them. Here in the US, there are 29,000 co-ops that employ 2 million people. Co-ops are not a rutabaga theory, but believing that they are a strategy for ending capitalism is a rutabaga theory. Will a socialist government dismantle capitalist enterprises and turn them into cooperatives? Absolutely, when there is a socialist government. <laughs> now, I don't want to be dogmatic about this. Just because something didn't work and end capitalism yet doesn't mean that it won't. But it does seem that anyone, including me, who was advocating an approach to social change that is more than a century old, ought to at least explain what has changed that will make it work now. And much is changing. Right? Mature capitalism has entered a new period of prolonged stagnation. I'll tell you about it tomorrow morning in the workshop on the economy. A new period of prolonged stagnation and decline that's bringing us new opportunities and so those are basically the two views, right? On the one hand, much of OWS is persuaded to a sort of Ron Paul minus the free market anti-government view of politics, while most socialists think that it matters who controls government and with it the army and police. When the corporate <laughs> right is moving to totally consolidate its hold, including over the Supreme Court, we don't just hand it to them without a fight, as the anarchists suggest, even if the alternative is not great which it certainly isn't. Now this doesn't mean that OWS should do what we do or we should urge them to. What's needed is an inside the system, outside the system, two-part strategy. OWS should be outside. The liberals and the unions can be inside. We socialists can do some of both and that raises the issues like the inadequacy of the mortgage settlement. Uh, it keeps justice in the forefront. It opens up new areas of discussion in the media, as it has already done. All right, let me end with a quick quiz. I'm going to give you a quotation from one of my favorite socialist authors. Tell me who said this. Production is carried on for profit, not for use. An army of unemployed always exists. The worker is constantly in fear of losing his job. Since unemployment and unemployed and poorly paid workers do not provide a profitable market, the production of consumer goods is restricted and great hardship is the consequence. 
Technological progress frequently results in more unemployment rather than in easing the burden of work for all. Unlimited competition leads to a huge waste of labor and to the crippling of the social consciousness of individuals. This crippling of individuals I consider to be the worst evil of capitalism. I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate these evils, namely the establishment of a socialist economy. Who said it? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and especially Steve for waking us all up. Um, so, Not right, no roofing. Um, so now, what we want to do? I mean, this is very thought-provoking and provocative, I think, for many of us. Uh, so what we want to do is discuss this a little bit. Um, I want to open up the floor for some questions. Um, not statements, please, just questions for the panel. Before I do that, I want to make a couple of announcements. Um, one is, I'm going to pass these flyers out while we're doing the Q&A. Uh, DSA is um, participating in Left Forum to a large degree this year. Left Forum is a huge left-wing uh, conference, which will have a lot of anarchists and socialists, so it should be a fun time. Um, and if you w are interested and think you might be able to come back to New York for March 16th through 18th, I encourage you to grab one of these flyers. Some people in this room will be helping us present uh, various workshops um, from our Get Up project, which is the grassroots economics training for understanding and power. It's a popular education uh, training to understand how neoliberal capitalism works and what the alternatives are. Uh, we also have a panel called Occupy Wall Street in the Future of the Democratic Left, 50 Years After the Other America. Francis Fox Piven is on the panel as well as Cornell West and Barbara Ehrenreich, and we're having a meet and greet after the panel, and all three of them are going to stop by and say hello as well. So I'm going to pass this out. If you think there's a possibility you would like to attend, just grab one of these. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that we just produced um, in DSA a, uh, a reading packet about Occupy Wall Street and the role of democratic socialists in Occupy Wall Street. Um, it's about 40 pages. It has um, discussion guidelines, discussion questions, and I think five articles. Really encourage you to talk to Andrew, the YDS organizer, or me if you're interested in a copy, and we can uh, mail you a copy, we can email you a copy, etc. cetera. Uh, but now we come back to the panel and the very thought-provoking things that were said. I want to open up the floor to questions. Um, I want to take you know, two or three questions at a time uh, so that the panel has a chance to digest them a little bit and respond. And I do want you to try to limit your questions to 30 seconds or a minute if, you, if it's a really long question, just so that we can make sure that everyone's voice is heard. Um, and I actually uh, want to start by asking the panel to consider um, uh, really talking about like the history of social movements and student movements, and what people in this room really need to think about going forward. Because we've talked about um, what's good about Occupy, how we differ from you know, the anarchists in Occupy. But I think it's important for us to think about what a few individuals in YDS in an organized fashion can accomplish. Because if you look at the Port Huron statement, there were only 40 students there. And they went on to form SDS and have a, a huge impact on the future of the student movement and on politics in America. So I'd like, I would love to hear the panel's thoughts on how YDSers can think about becoming um, change agents in the same way. Um, but now I want to open up the floor for a couple of questions. So if you want to question, ask a question, raise your hand, and I will call on a couple of people at a time. And I'm really going to try to privilege uh, people that haven't spoken. I know none of you have spoken yet. But people that haven't spoken, um, and folks that traditionally um, aren't in the public eye as much, so women, people of color, uh, in case there is you know, a sea of hands, which I don't see just yet. So I saw one hand over there. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for all that you said and all that you do. I'd like to ask if there are any personal changes that you all think are worth making and any that are especially worth making. So we'll, we'll let you guys come in that while I call on one or two other folks. And then you guys People might identify themselves. I'm Joe Schwartz, by the way. I teach at Temple University, and I teach democratic social. Can you give us an example of a personal change? Uh, switching from a large corporate bank to a credit union for your personal financial needs. Um, so you spoke a little bit about 
you know, having occupations on college campuses. As a lot of us are chapters on college campuses, what can we do um, as democratic socialists, being both part of having it where we are part of the outside of Occupy, but also being on the inside with dealing with administrative things on our campuses? Oh, I'm right. Thanks, Jerry. So let's have one more question, and then we'll hear responses, and then we'll come back and get more questions. How do you, uh, how do you suggest you go? Good trip. And the question she was asking is how do you go about uh, participating in a movement where you refuse to participate yeah. by not paying for your classes because you'll be dropped yeah. immediately? So how do you organize in that? So who would like to go first on the industries panel? Thank well, you. one <laughs> one uh, proposal, there are a lot of people talking about different ways that you could do a national <laughs> debt strike. And one uh, one way to look at this, uh, 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 my colleague Lawrence Weschler wrote a piece in uh, a Truth Dig uh, in December in which he said you should organize towards a national debt strike in which you try to get a million people to all say that they would not, that on a, on a date certain, let's just say October 1st, 2012, they would refuse to pay their mortgage because it's underwater. They would refuse to pay interest on their student debt. And they would be daring you know, the banks to come after a million people. Uh, I, I just throw that out as one example of, uh, of, of the way some people are talking about this. Uh, I think there's an incredible opportunity because of the fact you have it's not just students, but there are people many times who they have to begin to repay student debt when they're like 29, 30 years old. So the issue and how you're going to organize a, a around it is not going to be necessarily primarily on, on college campuses. Uh, and the fact that, that you have this incredible amount of student debt that uh, and, and what looks like it could be a higher education bubble that will be analogous to the housing bubble that could drag all kinds of people down. I think that's an opportunity to build bridges between the people who got screwed in the housing meltdown. And, uh, you know, it, it's outrageous that students in America today take out loans that are unforgivable, ever. You can't declare bankruptcy and clear that debt. So, you know, where did this special category of debt come from? Anyway, there are a lot of things that are worth raising, it seems to me. And there's also the question of credit card debt uh, and the kind of linkages that can be built with people who want to take action on credit card debt. What underlies those several uh, strategies uh, is an understanding that in the relationship between people who borrow and people who lend. The assumption is that the people who lend are always the top dogs, mm -hmm. and the people who borrow have to cower and shuffle. But in fact, the people who lend have an underlying vulnerability to the people who borrow, because they've got all that stuff on their books. Sure. And uh, so, so, uh, but that, but that also goes back to the, the, the question about personal changes. You can't do that kind of strategy individually. It has to be a collective action, and it has to be in different ways organized. Uh, otherwise, people can get hurt badly. Just a quick comment on that. I, it, it's not clear to me that, that students can do debt refusal. Uh, because precisely what you said, that you're held hostage by the institution. Uh, I, I, I think it's more the recent graduates who are unemployed uh, who can do it, and if it was linked up with mortgage refusal, that would be better. I think perhaps a, a thing on the campus might be to try to force the university to renegotiate with the lenders uh, and, and try to get uh, reductions in the interest or, 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 or some, something along those lines, uh, but, but not, get, uh, not get tossed out over this. Uh, two other quick aspects of it. Uh, the stu student loans are, uh, are, are family loans in a way. They may not be directly legally, right, but it, do it does come back to your parents one way or another, uh, unless you get an amazingly well-paying job 
as uh, soon as you graduate, uh, believe me, I know. Uh, and the, 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 the second part of that uh, is that it would be a great stimulus to the economy uh, if less money were going into the banks uh, for repayment of the loans, because Lord knows they're not lending it out again. But so, that, so that there is a public good mm -hmm. argument to be made for this. I mean, if they can take money out of the Social Security Trust Fund now, which they just did this week, to stimulate the economy, isn't a better way to do that, uh, reducing payment or, or a moratorium on student loans? And I just want to respond to what Ray was saying as, all, as well, to the idea of how do you have an inside-outside strategy at the campus level. And really, it's, you know, as with any, any sort of pressure campaign, you have the dynamic of the people that are pushing the envelope and causing disruption, like Francis was talking about. And then you have the people that are more moderate and willing to compromise. And it's, you can accomplish more as the moderate if there are people pushing the envelope. So the key is to really be in communication and have a thought out strategic corporate campaign strategy rather than just thinking that camping in front of the administration or in the lobby is going to be effective. So you really have to think of a strategy that leads to escalation and you have to have support from the student body and you have to have a plan and you have to have a way to negotiate. And I know that at Temple you guys are doing a lot to protest how the school is investing their money and making decisions about what is spent, you know, what the campus prioritizes. Um, so I, I think it gives you a lot of opportunity to really engage a lot of students and really begin to have conversations about what we talk about, which is democratic socialism. How can you both make uh, this, the campus more accessible to more students, but also how do you make it more democratic? How do you make sure that the students and the teachers and the workers have more of a voice rather than just the administrators? So YDS should definitely be out there pushing the envelope and talking about our vision, um, but you also need to be in dialogue and working with the more moderate people who can kind of cut the deal. And, and the deal that you can cut um, is improved by how, how, how widespread you can organize students to pressure for the, the, the bigger vision. Um, so let's take maybe three more questions. Okay, we're back. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Evan Hoskins. Uh, Francis talks about, you talked uh, briefly about Occupy having an effect on the electoral season. And my question is, how can Occupy maintain its credibility as an alternate structure and resist democratic co-option while still having a positive impact on truly liberal candidates? Okay, um, another question. Yeah, um, Speak up a little more. People might also say what, where they're from. You know, what uh, I'm an international student from Germany, studying at Ohio University last year. Um, I've got the following question. You present like Occupy mostly as a movement that could be like in the political left. But when I look at the political language of Occupy, I also see a lot of populism, like reminiscence to like the history of populism or to like, and I see a large difference between like a socialist critique of capitalism and the critique of big banks which is often voiced in Occupy. So could you comment on those elements of critique in the Occupy movement? I'll we'll take one more question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Enrique from uh, Wesleyan University. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I see the, I, I, mean, I see the rationale for Occupy movement. But I think, um, is anything being done to change public opinion in the United States? Yeah, I think that's that's the core of the problem. We, we of course, we do not live in a country that's full of socialists. And uh, I think for that, because and many of the socialist ideas, and I think that dialogue with people would actually is actually capable of changing that. But is there any form of dialogue that you feel might work that might uh, and? Okay, so it's difficult when you got the three questions of the four yeah. questions. It'd be easier to have one, 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 well, one, one, we, one question. Everybody wouldn't get to ask questions. That well, yeah, we did it that way. <laughs> the, that is true. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll say. A, a couple of things in response to the question comments. Uh, first, 
all movements are partly co-opted. That's their victory. They win things. And the, win thing, the winning things robs them of some of their supporters who were morally outraged that there was no unemployment insurance. Winning things satisfies the un, some of the unemployed. Don't be so afraid of co-optation. Go out and win. <laughs> and, you know, you can become president, too. So, <laughs> second, I think that movements do change public opinion. Uh, especially participation in movements changes the opinion of the participants. We usually, you know, we have a kind of linear view of how people get involved in great movements. First, we change their head. We talk to them a lot and induce them to come to a meeting and another meeting and then a demonstration. Uh, and then they are gradually transformed into young democratic socialists. <laughs> but I don't think it happens that way. I think that you know people get angry about particular things and that may lead them to affiliate or to act with, to join a movement, to join a march, a demo. That experience of participating in the movement can be transforming. And I have really seen that quite a lot. So we can change public opinion by writing editorials in the Wall Street Journal or not even in the New York Times. But we can change, maybe change public opinion with our movement activism and by reaching out to people over maybe particular issues, maybe not socialism to join with us and to act with us. And that can be transforming. Um, the question about populism, I think that's a good question. It goes back to something that Steve Max was saying that um, I think it's, I, I actually think that one of the reasons why Occupy Wall Street had such resonance is that in its own way, it built on uh, an opening that had been made by the Tea Party. And the problem for people who are committed to democratic socialism and building a state uh, that uh, can uh, provide uh, collective goods and services for people is that there's a profound um, uh, tendency in, in American history to be very suspicious of government and to, uh, that that suspicion is something that you can build movements out of. Uh, and somebody, I think it was uh, Maria was saying earlier, you know, talking about your panel that you're going to be looking back 50 years to democratic socialism after the other America. There's absolutely a complete difference between the context in which uh, SDS got started and the context we have today because uh, SDS came together and was trying to leverage and be the conscience of a very robust liberalism that uh, was trying to build a new frontier on the foundations of a new deal which would create a great society. It took for granted what it called corporate liberalism, that there were very strong uh, state institutions that you could make the people who were in charge of them, who in some cases were your mothers and fathers, you could make them guilty that they didn't go further. Now, you know, ever since Ronald Reagan, we've now, we're into now year number 25 or 30 of, of trying to dismantle the New Deal, New Frontier, Great Society State, so that when a populist movement comes up that's using an anti-statist rhetoric to um, uh, mobilize people, there's a danger of that populist strand, uh, you know, uh, catching fire and making it even more difficult for um, democratic socialists to get traction. Uh, and it, it, the situation becomes much more strategically complicated, I, I, I think. And I think that's one of the things Steve was trying to gesture towards. I'm going to take a, a crack at the uh, election question. Uh, th 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 this is difficult given the, uh, uh, the Occupy frame of mind. I, mean, I, I can certainly understand Occupy not thinking that people should campaign for a particular candidate. I mean, Brand doesn't think that. 
Uh, I, I can understand Occupy not thinking it's particularly important to vote. I can't understand that Occupy would think that it was okay for people to be told they can't vote when they should be able to. Right? If anybody thinks that, they ought to be exposed to thinking that. Uh, and, and, and so there are a lot, of, a lot of issues and a lot of campaigns that can be done uh, around the right-wing effort to deny ballot access to people. Uh, you know, and, 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 and we say it takes different forms in different states. I mean, what, what, one thing I was just thinking about is, is uh, senior citizens. You don't have to think about senior citizens. I can't help it. Uh, think about <laughs> senior citizens uh, who have given up their driver's licenses because they're too old to drive and now they don't have the right ID to vote. Right? I mean, it would be fine to get 15 of them in a room uh, and, and, and demand why they can't vote. Right? We have states that have laws where the, uh, the length of time that you're given to update a change of address in your driver's license is twice the length of time that you need to get the valid ID to vote. Right? So people who have moved can't vote because the uh, new driver's licenses are only issued once every 10 years. Right? So there's all kinds of stuff that can be done at the Motor Vehicle Bureau, the stuff that can be done at the Board of Election. Where, wherever these injustices are taking place, it's not so much in New York City at the moment, but wherever they are, uh, there's a lot of direct action opportunities uh, that Occupy could get into without being partisan and without putting its blessing on any candidate. So I just want to add to what Steve's talking about. You know, the, the voter suppression is absolutely um, vicious, and it's not just about senior citizens. It's definitely about people of color and low-income people, and it's also about student voters, especially because young people have a pretty progressive voting uh, ha pretty progressive voting habits compared to um, the older generation. Uh, so if it's something that any YDS chapters are interested in working on, we have a lot of resources and it's t it is completely something that is a way to participate in electoral politics without actually campaigning for a candidate and you, it is a vote, protecting the right to vote, which is an imperfect right already, is very critical, prevent it from being um, further eroded. Um, can, can I just add yeah, something yeah. to that? You know, let's be, it's very clear that what the Republicans in control of state legislatures are doing is trying to purge the new voters who turned out for Obama in 2008. They are young voters, they are poor voters, they are minority voters. Uh, and you know, we're a little bit clunky about this. We don't see that there is a history of election campaigning in the United States which has to do not with which candidate you vote with, vote for, but who gets to vote. That has been a very important issue <laughs> in American election campaigns, at least since the Civil War. And if you want to crunch the numbers, the you know the Pew uh, Research Company just recently did a poll, and it, and it just backs up what we already knew, which is the people that have the, po the voting blocks that have the politics are the most most similar to us are young people, low-income people, and definitely people of color, especially black people. Very social democratic voting blocks, and that is why they're being targeted by the right wing. So we really, it is a critical issue for us to consider participating in. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is what Francis was talking about with the importance of activism and participation as a tra transformative experience. It is absolutely true, and that's one of the reasons that Occupy has been so profound for so many people is People will show up and there are so many ways to participate and just through participating and seeing the reality of what happens when you go up against the cops or whatever uh, really transforms people and that's why DSA and YDS believe very strongly in praxis. You can't, um, you can't just study theory um, without also participating in activism because your uh, perspective on both have to, your perspectives on both have to inform each other. If you're not out there uh, helping generate street heat, number one, you're not going to get any credibility with other mass movements, but you're also not truly going to understand uh, what the real conditions are. But if you just participate in activism for activism's sake, then you're not benefiting from the whole history of theorists, um, democratic socialists, and others who have thought through how power works. So you really, you know, our, a democratic socialist is very important to both study theory and educate yourselves, but also to participate in activism. So let's have some more questions. There was a hand back here. Yeah, from a couple hours. I would add, 
all the of these lists of sewage movement, they are going to ask about sewage movement. When it comes to sewage movement, so sewage movement be represented of all sewage, even sewage who have more his ideas are counterproductive to the sewage movement, I say be an advocate for all these sewage ideas are similar to the movements. Also could be a combination of the two. How do you want to the answer to that question? You can have a student movement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you repeat it one more time? Oh, oh. oh. Yeah, he's, he's asking about <clears throat> should a student movement be something that um, tries to be as inclusive as possible and incorporating students of all political persuasions, or should it, should we try to build a student movement that actually represents our own ideals and invites schools to join? That's a, good question. Yes. That's a very good question. Okay, let's have a couple more. Uh, hi, my name is Ben. I'm here in New York. Um, I've heard a lot of criticism about other ways that have been ineffective in overturning capitalism, such as radical capitalism, <coughs> democracy, co ops, whatnot. But I haven't heard a lot of reflection on the fact that sort of reformist social democracy has been kind of an abject failure everywhere in Europe. It's just being dismantled by capital. And so, why should we sort of embrace, as someone who just came here out of curiosity, why would we embrace this sort of like performance, social democratic stance that seems to be advocated? Uh, and uh, my name is Will, uh, I'm from Wesleyan. Uh, sort of building off that point, uh, lest I come off as a combative anarchist, uh, I, like, you, Sort of you, yeah. You preface this. You talk about all these things that are rutabaga theories, and then you say this social or democratic socialism has to be about collective a action. It has to be about negotiating. It has to be willing to co-opt. Like none, none of those things sound like you're going to be taking down or like dismantling the capitalism. It sounds like you're playing into like these institutionalized like hierarchies that we have in the society. And I mean, can you really say that democratic socialism is? A more effective means of change than anarchism, like the you you introduce uh, Occupy as like this anarchist movement, or it has like these anarchist strains. So, wouldn't you say that anarchism has like more of a foothold in like our contemporary political conversation than democratic socialism does? Uh, I just have a question about um, do you think that we should force through the separation? financial uh, banking and uh, saving and loan banking, commercial banking. And uh, once we do that, uh, should we, once that financial empire has to eat its own debt, should we start our own credit system? Yes. Essentially based off of written in the Constitution where Congress can create money for projects? So, who wants to start? Uh, I'll start. Uh, I really do, do want to respond to uh, to you and, and to your observation that while it is true, as Steve said so energetically, that anarchists don't have a strategy for how to get to socialism or some other utopian vision of our society, uh, neither do we. That's, that's just the fact that we, we've had a lot of social democrats and democratic socialists. We've had a lot of socialist parties. We have worked to try to moderate capitalism. And Greece is going down now as a result of the pressure of the banks. And Greece had a socialist government. You say it wasn't a real socialist government. Government, but all of our socialist parties and our socialist governments turn out to, have to be really socialist. And I say that not because I'm bitter or angry at socialists or whatever. I say that because I think that we have to appreciate that the anarchist flare up uh, among youth movements is a reflection of the real disappointment at earlier failures, at earlier efforts at social change, and an acute sense of uncertainty and skepticism about formulaic remedies like socialism. 
They don't know how to get from here to there, but they know they don't know how to get from here to there. And they see direct action and radical democracy as a way to live and to try until we can figure it out. Take a, a, another crack at the question about uh, Europe and social democracy and, and uh, what, 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 what the nature of the governments are that, that, that we talked about. Uh, it's so frustrating to be so far from the question, I have to say again. Uh, in fact, if you, the guy who said that, can you just quick restate it for me? Yeah. Uh, he was the anarchist. You want the revolutionary socialist, right? No, I want the guy. Yeah, the first, the first the revolutionary. So, yeah. You want the guy further on the left. You want the guy who's from the ISO. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. No, I'm just getting a lot of criticism about uh, radical disparate democracy, so ops, and other things that have worked, but it's going to be more an issue that historically the social democratic platform has been a failure. So this revolution. Okay, okay. No, I got you. Got you. All right. So here, 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 here is the thing of this. And, and, and I think the answer is actually Greece, but I do have a different cut on it. Right? And, and, that, and that is that, uh, that, that the Greeks are in revolt at this point. Right? The, and, and we're seeing this uh, in, in many places throughout Europe, that, that people are in revolt, uh, and, and they're in revolt in far larger numbers uh, than we see anything here, uh, and it penetrates uh, far more deeply uh, into those societies than they are here. Whether they're going to be able to pull themselves together ideologically uh, to, to figure out what's wrong there remains to be seen. But what has happened is that thanks to social democracy in that part of the world, uh, a structure has been put together that people truly value. Right? And, and now it's being taken away from them. Right? Wages are being cut. The minimum wage is being cut. A huge whack is being taken out of pensions there. Uh, and, and those play a much larger role in people's lives because they have social democratic governments than the safety net plays in people's lives here uh, because it's so inadequate. Uh, and people are now massing to defend what they've won. So yes, it's true that capitalism is taking it away from them. It's also true that it's put them into a revolutionary mood. Now, where that goes remains to be seen, uh, but we don't know a better way of getting them into that mood. Um, it's time for a confession before I came here. I wasn't even sure I should be here because I'm so uncertain as to what the ultimate goal should be for movements of social change at this point. Uh, the 19th century movements of anarchism and Marxism actually shared a, uh, a, a conviction that ultimately uh, the state would wither away. And they uh, shared a conviction, if they were Bakunin or um, Kropotkin, that capitalism would go away. And at this stage of my life, having once been <coughs> in my own head an anarchist when I was younger, and also anti-capitalist, I cannot for the life of me imagine what the world would look like given the challenges that we face in terms of climate change, uh, in terms of uh, uh, globalization and what it is to have global markets, I, I can't see how you can regulate all the things that need to be regulated without forms of governance that are at um, uh, levels that aren't just national but are global, in fact, and transnational, uh, which means some version of states. Similarly, after the experience of the Soviet Union um, and the dismal failure of all centralized command economies, uh, the question of is there an alternative to markets and what is it is, uh, it seems to me, uh, it's too easy to just say anti-capitalism at this point. What's the alternative? What kind of mixed markets? What kind of regulation? I mean, you are a generation that is going to grow up facing basic questions about, uh, about what the ultimate just society looks like and the formulas and the slogans that were crystallized in the 19th century don't have, to me, a whole lot of contact with the real challenges that the species faces. Yeah, it's good to pick up a couple of more questions that didn't get addressed. Uh, is that okay, Maria? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question about the, should there be a, uh, a, a an all embracing student movement uh, or should it be more uh, more specific? 
Uh, m movements can't be controlled and, and movements can't be built. Right? We, movements occur for specific historical reasons when they occur. Organizations can be built. Right? The organization exists within the movement. Right? We, we need to think about what kind of organization we want to build. And in and, and YDS, it's not something that is open to, to every conceivable opinion uh, among students. It's fairly specific. It's a socialist organization. It exists within a movement that is open uh, to every opinion and should be open to every opinion. Uh, so that they're, they're two separate things. Uh, about the banks, yeah. Uh, we should bring back Glass-Steagall. That separation should be put back. Uh, they should get screwed on the money. Uh, and, and, and I'll talk about how government is already printing money uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so uh, this is a commercial. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry we did. We, I, I just realized that we are running out of time. So we are going to have to wrap up. I think the speakers would be willing to stick around for a few minutes if you want to come up with specific questions. Um, but I just saw that it's getting pretty late. I just want to emphasize, I want to close by emphasizing a couple of things. Number one is DSA and YDS, we don't think we have all the answers. Part of, part of our message is that we don't have a, a, a vision of a utopia. We can't describe what it looks like because it's going to be democratic. And the way that we get there has to be democratic. We don't think we have all the answers, and we don't think that we're the leaders of some, some sort of um, revolution or movement. We want to participate. We think we have some good ideas, but we understand that we don't know what it's going to look like when we get there. And I think that's the beauty of Occupy Wall Street is, you know, at least here in New York, it's not just anarchists. There are a whole range of political thought, and uh, people welcome you no matter, you know, what your politics are, even though there is the issue of uh, um, a fake leaderless movement, uh, which Jim talked about, which you do have to keep in mind. So the, the idea that the way we get to democratic socialism is democratic, I think is very critical for us to remember. And that's, as I said, one of the best things about Occupy. It's sort of, you can make it what you want it to be. And we can participate as democratic socialists. Anybody can participate. And that the point of this conference is to understand what's going on in Occupy and understand what's going on in capitalism and to figure out how we can be most strategic based on our understanding and help build Occupy. Um, so, you know, we're, we want to work within Occupy in a comradely fashion, um, but we don't think we have all of the answers. So we're here this weekend to discuss and debate with each other. Um, so that's how we're going to close. Uh, let's thank all of our panelists. <laughs> I'm just going to make a few announcements. I do want to ask if you have those or if there's extra left forum flyers lying around, please bring them to me. So let's listen to Andrew for a couple minutes. Hey, everybody. Uh, just some real quick announcements. My name is Andrew Porter. I'm the national organizer of YDS. Um, thank you all for coming. This is really great to see this room full. Uh, it makes me very happy. I've worked really hard to get you here. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, so first, there, there were keys lying on the table out there. Do these look familiar to anyone? There's a bike key, and then there's some, some mouse keys. So if you're missing keys, just come to me. Oh, awesome. All right. Cool. All right. That was taken care of. Uh, so secondly, um, when you leave the room, please clean up after yourself. Um, you we're using this space, and they're being really great and not charging us for it because some St. Francis students are sponsoring the conference. So please be respectful and clean up the space after yourself. Um, then I just want to have the coordinating committee from YDS stand up. So if you have any problems or any questions throughout the uh, throughout the weekend, like these are the people you should talk to. You should all stand up now. Um, yes, put your hands in there. All right. So you see some of them. There's some. No, there aren't any back there, but they're around here. Uh, there are more coming. They're not all here tonight. So if you have any questions, any comments, concerns, uh, I'm not around. Talk to them. Talk to Maria. We'll try to deal with whatever's going on. Um, then I just also want to recognize the, the caucus chairs as well. Two of them aren't here, unfortunately, but Tom is. So Tom is the caucus chair for the LGBTQ caucus. We have a women's caucus and a people of color caucus as caucus chairs as well. Uh, they couldn't make it here tonight, but they'll be here on Saturday. So if you have any issues surrounding that, please see them. The final thing is that 
Uh, tonight we're going, we're having a meetup at uh, a bar after this. It's 18 and over, so most people should be able to make it. Um, and we have directions here, so we just kind of pair off into large groups, and then we can give everyone a pair of directions, and we should be able to make it there together. Um, yes? Just remember to be back here by 8 a.m., yeah. so don't stay out too late. Well, 9, 9. Breakfast starts at 9. Breakfast starts at 9, so, you know, don't... Workshops at 10. Yeah. Now, workshops that start at 10. Breakfast starts at 9. So remember, don't go too crazy. Tomorrow's a long day, but it's going to be really good. Um, so we'll see you back here tomorrow. I'll have Thank you. Communal Socialist Adderall. I mean, no, Advil! Advil! <laughs>